Right, it's time to start. I've given us 15 minutes, 15 minutes grace. I think we ought to start now. So we start with a word of prayer, and then those who catch up can catch up. Father, thank you for, thank you for your word. Thank you for your supply to us. Thank you for your love. And Lord, teach us to, to see into your word and to know your will for our lives. Amen. Can you remember where we finished last time? You can't hear? Right, look. I'll move the table forward slightly. Right. Last time we ended up with two feasts at Jerusalem. Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Dedication. Um, those two are about two to three months apart from each other. Um, and what I'm going to do is go back and look at the gap in between the two feasts to see what happened during that time. I did the two feasts last time because John puts them together in one block and they're all related to each other. So now we're going to go back six, back six months from the crucifixion to the Feast of Tabernacles where it ended and we'll see where we go on from there. So if you'd like to turn to uh, Luke chapter 10 in your Bibles. And it's virtually all in Luke this time, because what you will find is this six months, or th this particular section, is only covered in the book of Luke. In fact, actually, let's go to the... There should be a map on your table as well. We'll look at the map first. We've only got one per table, I'm afraid. I only printed out one. <clears throat> if you find Jerusalem, which is slightly to the left of the Dead Sea, and up slightly. Dead Sea's at the bottom, slightly up. That's where the, obviously the Feast of Tabernacles and everything goes, happens. What happens next? Jesus has come down into Judah for the first time in a long, long time. He's now about to send his disciples out, as we can see, and he's going to do a long tour, uh, what we used to, used to in the old days called a crusade, an evangelical crusade. We can't use that word anymore, but yeah. yeah Billy Graham did, so. Anyway, and he, this is the last preaching tour that Jesus is going to do. He will carry on preaching in set locations after that, but this is the last tour from village to village. And what happens, if you go from Jerusalem, he goes probably, can you see there's a long line of villages going up that, those mountains there? That's up towards Samaria. I would imagine he goes all around the ones around Jerusalem and heads up there, back towards Galilee. There's one point it talks about Jesus being between Galilee and Samaria. So obviously he may travel all the way back up into Galilee and then travel back again. And when he gets back again, that's back to the Feast of Dedication, about two to three months later. So this is probably a two to three month preaching tour going around all the little villages and towns. And what we're about to see is Jesus organises everything in advance. Now I have to commit, I have committed a sin. I have disagreed with my favourite teacher. Oh, this boy. He puts Jesus going back to the Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Dedication at a different point to me. I might tell you why I've changed my, changed my mind. There's two times in this section we'll read it says that Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. There's only two times that Jesus heads towards Jerusalem after the Feast of Tabernacles. One is to the Feast of Dedication and the next is for the Triumphal Entry. He goes close to Jerusalem, he goes to Beth Bethany where Lazarus is to raise Lazarus from the dead but he doesn't go to Jerusalem. So both times it says he's heading towards Jerusalem but for the final time Jesus heads towards Jerusalem he comes up from Damascus to Jerusalem up via the Damascus Road. Oh, uh, sorry, the Jericho Road from Jer Jericho to Jerusalem. He doesn't come from there and this actually says he's going to Jerusalem between Samaria and Galilee, which is up high. So if you look, that's up high, coming down. Jericho is down in the valley. So when Jesus finally heads to uh, the triumphal entry, it's from a completely different direction. So I have disagreed with my favourite teacher and the wisdom of centuries. And I'm doing all, the, all of this section as one big preaching tour. And we're going to end up back at Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. I might be completely wrong, and the likelihood is I am, but don't worry about it. 
the, um, Luke doesn't say when Jesus went to Jerusalem in this time. So it is not critical when it happened. But sometime during this stage, it did happen. Right, let's go to Luke chapter 10. We'll start verse 1. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70. Have any of you got 72? Some of you might have 72. It, there's two different versions, two different versions that come down to us. One's got 72, one's got 70. I don't think it's critical, okay? Um, 70 others and sent them two and two ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. So he, he gets these, seven, I'm going to say 70 because it's easier to, it's either 35 pairs or 36 pairs, whichever you want to go by. And he sends them out each to each village he is going to. Now this is from Jerusalem, from the Feast of Tabernacles, where they are just trying to kill him as usual. I think there's a number of reasons he's doing this. Firstly, he knows he's got a very short period of time left and he wants to do this properly. He wants to do it organised. He wants these people to go out to prepare the ground for him, possibly even to find him a place to stay at each place as he goes around. Also, the Pharisees want to get Jesus somewhere away from the crowds and they want to have a big enough group of soldiers or whatever to be able to get Jesus at that stage. So their little intelligences will be out all over the local area, waiting to see where Jesus is going to be. Suddenly someone comes running in to the, to the priest and say, that his disciples are preaching over here. Somebody else comes running in, no, his disciples are preaching over here. And suddenly all these intelligences come in from every direction. These disciples are preaching everywhere. Where do they go to? So it almost like Jesus is putting up a little bit of a smoke screen in some ways I, I, this is what I think so it just confuses them so that they want to get Jesus they want to get all their forces in one place but where do they go and what's going to probably happen is these disciples will preach they'll come back to Jesus he will then go into that town for one day and then move off so before the, the forces of uh, darkness can get there and so it's taking the sting out of the tail for a while anyway he has already sent the 12 apostles out on the same mission, earlier on, we, we talked about that. And he gives the 70 very similar powers. Um, and he says to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send labourers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs amidst wolves. Carry no purse, no bag. That means a rucksack. So when I went backpacking, I had a thumping great big rucksack on with several days supply of food none of that go without that no shoes that means a second pair by the way greet no one on the way that sounds a bit rough doesn't it and wherever house you enter say peace to this house if a man of peace is there your peace will rest upon him if not it will return to you stay in that house eating and drinking whatever they give to you for a labor is worthy of his wages do not keep moving from house to house Say you went into a village and a poor person let you in to start with and laid not very much in front of you, but that's all they had. And then a rich person come along and said later on, come and stay in my house. Thank you, poor person. I've been staying over here. To, to offer hospitality to someone was an honour, was sac sacrosanct in Jewish terms, because it always had been from their days of a, when they were nomadic. So for someone who was poor to give you lodging, that was, you had to honour that person. So even if a, a very rich person then comes to you and says, come to a feast at my house, no, you stay at the poor person. If you're fortunate, maybe the rich person will ask you in to start with. But that was the idea Jesus was saying, don't move around trying to find your best location, trying to find the best way. What about this bit about not talking to anybody? So you've got to walk along, and you might be walking for two to three days, and you've not got to talk to anybody else. Possibly. Possibly. Let's go to Kings. Two Kings. Uh, so it's Two Kings, chapter four. This was in the days of Elisha. Now this. I think was a standard way of doing things when, they were, when a, a prophet or somebody was sending a message. God would often tell people to do the same thing. So we're looking um, 
for Elisha. Um, a lady, her son, has just died. She has come to the prophet Elisha and said, please come and sort him out. Elisha, on the other hand, is fairly old and probably can't walk that fast. And so he sends his servant on ahead of him, hoping the servant will be able to do the job quickly. Uh, so chapter 4, verse 29. 29. And he said to Gehazi, this is Elisha, gird up your lines, take my staff in your hand and go your way. If you meet a man, do not salute him. And if anybody salutes you, do not answer him and lay my staff on the lad's face. In other words, I am sending you with my words in your mouth or my instructions. You are not to stop and be distracted. You are not to let those words or anything else go anywhere else. So often when God sent a, pro a prophet, I mean, there was one poor prophet who could not say anything until God said, told him to say something. I can't remember which one it was, but he was told, you will not say anything. You will be dumb until I give you my word to speak. So the other, in other words, what I'm putting in you, it's not going to go anywhere in between. It's going to get there. So this is what Jesus is saying to these. He's sending them out like prophets, like messengers. Now, can you see that nice Victorian looking photo, that picture there? On the right hand side, you're all looking at that, wondering what it is, aren't you? I grew up with that picture. It's a, it's a boys brigade picture. When I, when I was young, there was two of them, either side, on the, the hall that we used to meet. I liked the one on the left. It was a young chap, a young boy, walking along with Jesus. And there was Jesus bending down to his level. And they were obviously having a wonderful time chatting to each other. This one on the other side, he's not looking at Jesus. He's not paying attention to him. I don't like that one. When, I, when we were older, we actually took them down off the wall and I found a little print at the bottom, the messenger. That's what it is. Jesus saying, right, go. Don't stop. Don't meet anybody else. Don't get distracted. You're my messenger. So very old, very Victorian. Jesus is obviously very white. But nonetheless, I like that picture. They tried to redo it since then, but I don't like the modern version. That's why I put that in there, just for the fun of it. So these disciples are sent out. They're given the same, some of the same commands that the other, the, the twelve disciples were given, which was to cast out demons, to cure the sick. Now I can imagine they didn't all go out in one mass and come back together. What would probably happen? Jesus said, "What right, you two? I want you to go off today to this village. I want you to go off that to village, and you can imagine them coming back in pairs." and telling Jesus what goes on. So I think at the bottom of this section, it's a summary of what they said as they were coming back. So if we go to um, verse 17. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So they were finding they could throw out demons for the first And this would be the first time they'd ever done it. They'd have watched it, but they'd have never done it. In the middle, Jesus gives some other instructions. Have you heard about brushing the dust off of your feet? Yeah. You've heard of that? So as you walk out of a place, you brush the dust off of your feet. It's a sign that, oh, I don't even want to have anything to do with you anymore. Yeah. I always look for a biblical reason for that, as opposed to, ah, oh, I hate the lot of you, I'm going away, that type of thing. There's two sections I found. If we go to Nehemiah, chapter 5. This is something that Nehemiah did. It's not quite the same, but you, you see the same principle here. It's chapter, uh, verse 12. Uh, Nehemiah, chapter 5, verse 12. This is Nehemiah talking to some of the rich people in Jerusalem at the time they come back. And these rich people have been lending out money and making the poor people's life a misery by demanding it back. And so there's rules about that in the Bible about not lending with interest to Jews and things like that. And so Nehemiah is sorting this out. And he's making them make a promise. So we read this. They, um, sorry. they then said, we will give back and will require nothing from them and do exactly as you say. So this is the rich people saying back to, to Nehemiah. So I called the priests and took an oath of them that they would do according to their promise and I also shook out the front of my garments saying may God shake out every man from you who does not fulfill his promise even thus may you be shaken out and be emptied 
Can you imagine standing up, you've been eating on your lap, the crumbs are down the front, and you stand up and you shake the crumbs out. And that's what he was doing. He literally stood up and said, may God shake you out as if you were no more than crumbs under his feet. Similar. Similar. Not quite, though. Let's go to... Actually, um, the Apostle Paul does that in the New Testament, by the way, as well. When he goes and he's preaching in Athens and he's talking to the, the Jewish people in the synagogue, they start getting a bit shirky with him and he literally gets up and he shakes out his garments at them. So they did that in the New Testament as well. He says, from now on, in Athens at least, I'm going to the Gentiles. Something like that. I think, I, I would imagine it's just like when you stand up and you've got crumbs down the front of you. And it's probably everybody does it or they've got dust on them and they just shake it out like that. So it's other words, you, you're, you're irrelevant. Yeah, you, you're gone. Let's, though, go to the book of Numbers. This I found more interesting. Caleb. Can you remember who Caleb was? One of the spies. Excellent. Uh, 14.22. And this is God speaking to the people of Israel through Moses. Surely, and think of this in relationship to the message of Jesus going to the people in his time. Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, sh uh, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will give him the land which he entered and his descendants and shall take possession of it forever. Now you can see the connection there with the message has gone out and there's people who've rejected it, there's people who, who've accepted it. So Caleb was someone who had a, as a, who had a different spirit in him. And do you have the same word there, different spirit? And he accepted the words. So let's see how later on that bears out. So we go to Deuteronomy. It's chapter 1, 34. And this is, once again, Moses talking back about the same incident. In fact, he's, he's, re he's relating now what happened in the past, those original words, to a different generation. And the Lord heard the sound of your words, and he was angry, and took an oath, saying, Not one of these men of this evil generation shall so see the good land which I swore to give to their fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephthah. He shall see it, and to him and his sons I will give the land on which he has set foot, because he followed the Lord fully. We've got the feet coming in here. We've got dust on the feet. So Caleb, where he was the spy, and he went out and spied out that land, that land was promised to him. Now Jesus is telling the, these disciples to go out, to go into that town and preach the gospel. If they reject you, as you go out, you are not part of the inheritance that is due to the kingdom of God. So they were preaching the kingdom of God. In other words, your town, I didn't tread on it. The kingdom of God is not coming to your town. Yeah. And it, what their message is, that Jesus told them, is to let them know the kingdom of God is close to you. And undoubtedly, if the town accepted Jesus, um, there was someone there who was willing to have him to stay for the night, so probably Jesus would have gone in and stayed with the same people that the disciples went into. Jesus would have gone to that town. If, on the other hand, they rejected him, he would have walked past so the kingdom of God is not coming to your town. So that's the symbol the symbology there. The, yeah. Well, there's some yeah, there's some spies spying out the ground. So it's, but they're not. I mean, the the spies that were sent out obviously to Jericho weren't sheep amongst wolves in that sense. So. Um, but yeah, but yeah, basically, and that's in some ways our job as well to take the gospel out. Whether we are supposed to brush the dust off our feet as we walk out of a place or not, I don't know. But um, that's a bit rough. But anyway, that's where that that idea comes from. Jack, wasn't it also an insult in uh, Arabic countries to show the songs of the foot? It is, yes. Um, 
Yeah, so you can show your feet, but you can't show your sandals. It's your sandals you can't show. So if you, show, if you take off a sandal, to, if you hit somebody with a sandal, that's almost the ultimate insult. If you hit somebody with a sandal. Um, yes, it's the sandal. So when Moses... Yes. Yeah. There was, a, there was a, a Jewish tradition as well that if... Um, there was something called the Leverett marriage, which is the brother marrying his, his sister-in-law if, the, if the, brother, uh, the older brother had died. If he refused to do so, what was supposed to happen is the woman was supposed to take, I think, take off his sandal and slap him with it. Because he refused to, as it were, he, he, she was, as it were, her, his brother's territory, his brother's possession. Yeah, so, and, and when Boaz, for instance, swaps sandals with the other man, he's saying, well, you're, you're taking my possession, you're also taking a slap in the face if you're not prepared to do it. So it's, um, it, feminists won't like it that the woman's obviously the possession of the man in that sense. But it, obviously there's more, there's more, far more involved spiritually than just that simple bit on top. Yeah, yeah. You can tread on me any day. So. Um, one of the other things he's, Jesus says to his, we're back in um, Luke again now. Oh, back in Luke. One of the other things he says to his disciples is that you will um, be stung by snakes and they won't kill you and bitten by scorpions. That is... It is a physical thing because it happened to the Apostle Paul, if you remember, after the shipwreck. He was collecting firewood and a snake came out and bit him. Everyone expected him to die, he just shook it off. And from thinking he was a criminal to they thought he was a god after that. But other than that, it is mainly spiritual. Because Jesus, during this, says, I saw Satan falling from heaven. In fact, the word for, to, he says, I, I saw, is to, to gaze carefully. I think he had a vision from God and he saw into the future what was going to happen. And he says, I was gazing carefully. If you look at the tenses, which is... Um, so I've jumped on a bit here. So it's verse 18, so Luke 10, 18. And Jesus said to him, I was watching Satan fall from heaven. Have you got the same there? Yeah, or saw, yes, in the past tense as well. So, so when he's talking about treading on scorpions and things underneath that that is basically demons it is not as a certain church in America thinks the genuine thing and as part of their worship they will get poisonous snakes and see if they can be bitten by it um, I think that's putting the Lord your God to the test I, I, personally I think so, so that's what that means in that context it's talking about Satan it's talking about demons and you, obviously the disciples had just cast out demons and things like that so Let's go on a bit now. So the 70 return back. They're happy. Jesus rejoices at that time. Um, he says, rejoice not because the demons are subject to you, but because your names are written in heaven. I think it is. So that's the important bit there. I'm rushing on a bit here, I'm afraid, because I'm trying to cover seven chapters today. So you can read a lot of this. A lot of this is self-explanatory, so you can read it at home. Jesus is obviously travelling around the villages now. And a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test. This is verse 25. Saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now this, this guy wasn't asking this because he wanted to know. He was trying to show off. This is probably a standard, standard sort of rabbinical question. And he was going to show Jesus, show this miserable carpenter how intelligent he was. And wipe the floor with this miserable whatever. Jesus does what all good Jewish rabbis would do. Well, what does the Bible say? And immediately comes back because he knows the answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength and your neighbour as yourself. Okay, says Jesus, just do that. And you can imagine him turning around and walking away. At which point the guy goes, oh, oh, hold on a minute. Ha, who's my neighbour? Who's my neighbour? Throwing back a question. And they had lots of Jewish arguments about this, the Pharisees basically worked out that their neighbour was their fellow Pharisee. So you could be nice to your fellow Pharisee, you didn't have to worry about anybody. They had lots of arguments about this. There was another argument that your Jew was your fellow neighbour. Gentiles weren't. Don't forget about Gentiles. In fact, neighbouring kingdom was Samaria. In fact, Samaria was surrounded by Israel. And so here we have the story of the Good Samaritan. 
but you all know well enough, I don't have to go into it. So Jesus is turning the tables on this guy who wanted to show off and wipe the floor with Jesus. And Jesus shows him in that story. It's interesting in that story as well. You've got the priest who represented the um, sacrifices, couldn't save the man. You've got the Levite who, who represented the law who couldn't save that man. Who was the Samaritan? <coughs> A Gentile. Something else. Good Sunday school answer and it's correct. <laughs> what did they say about Jesus? Do we not say well of you? You are a Samaritan and have a demon? Yeah, yeah. In fact, the word for Samaritan and that the Jews had a great big hagiography of, um, of demons and angels. Lots of different names. And the name for the Samaritan and the name for the, one of the chief demons was virtually identical. And so the so the, the rabbis took that and said, look, they're all demons. They're all subjects of demons. So a, a, a Samaritan would always be thought to be demon-possessed. And so when they throw that insult at Jesus, they say, you are a Samaritan and have a demon. And the other question is, which way was the Samaritan? Why was the Samaritan on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem? Which does not go through Samaritan territory. Why would a Samaritan be going to Jerusalem? And that's the next question, which way was he going? Was he going to the feast? Ah, was he going there? Well, and you notice... The worship of the Gentile and the... Yeah, yeah the, Gen the Samaritans had their own temple uh, higher up. If you find Mount Gerizim, which I think is high, near Sychar, I think, a bit higher up, got Mount Gerizim, they had their own temple there. A Samaritan would go there. Samaria, so, yeah, he wouldn't go near that on that road. So here you have a Samaritan travelling... I believe, up the road toward Jerusalem, saves the man, pays two days' wages, and says, I will return on the third day. Be a good guy. That's, what the, that's the hidden message in that message. That's Jesus. The rejected, the despised person. He's the one who picks this broken man up. He's the one who pays for him. Two days, and he's the one who comes back. I think, yes. Obviously, the whole story on the surface, underneath it, yes, I think it's Jesus. The despised, the rejected Samaritan, he's the one who picks up this broken, injured man. The others won't touch him for biblical reasons, because a priest cannot touch a dead body, nor can a Levite. And if they're on their way up to Jerusalem, they cannot touch him. They didn't bother to check whether he was dead or not. Um, probably for other more selfish reasons, but that's, that's what I think in that story anyway. Let's jump on. Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha lived in the town of Bethany. So if we look at the map, Bethany is just below Jerusalem. Or just to the right of, going towards the, the Dead Sea. So you can see he was going around the different the towns at this stage. Undoubtedly, the disciples would have gone into Bethany already. They would have already preached. They would have been invited into their house. And then this is Jesus coming on later on. I can imagine in each town what would happen... Jesus would turn up overnight. He would stay in a house. The next morning, he would start preaching. By the time the news had got to the, the, the Pharisees, he would be off to the next village and stay overnight and so forth like that. That's what I think was happening here. Yeah. Um, so here, obviously, he's coming in at night to Mary and Martha's house. Martha is being the perfect hostess, as all Jewish women should be, as all ladies should be, the perfect hostess. <laughs> Christmas dinner, I, I lay my, my cards on the table. It, it's got to be absolutely perfect, hasn't it? Everything's got to be absolutely perfect. <coughs> Mary, on the other hand... <laughs> Mary, on the other hand, was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, firstly, sitting at his feet, that sounds a bit dubious, doesn't it? Except in most houses in those days, you didn't have chairs. Only the important people would be sitting on chairs. Everybody else would be sitting on the floor. And to sit at the feet of a rabbi was what a disciple did. So, for instance, the Apostle Paul, if you look up the reference, we won't look it up, but the reference I've got underneath for Gamaliel, Paul said, I, sat, I was taught, I sat at the feet of yeah. Gamaliel. Yeah. So that is where you learn. Mm -hmm. Women were not allowed to be taught by rabbis. Mm -hmm. Women's place was in the house, in the home, in the kitchen. So here's Jesus specifically saying to a woman, mm -hmm. no, her place is not in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Now, that does not mean... 
all the time. He says, at this particular occasion, the place where she should be is there. Because that's where she wants to be. And you can imagine Jesus saying, don't worry about that. Just bring out whatever you've got, put it on the floor, we'll, we'll deal with it. You can imagine. A woman was not allowed to. So for this was whether the feminists would like Jesus sitting, or sitting at the feet of Jesus. I don't know, but that's what it was. This was something quite big. And Jesus didn't care. Prayer. Let's go on. Jumping on again. Uh, verse 11. Uh, chap- chapter 11, 1 to 3. And it came about, he was praying in a certain place and he had finished. One of his disciples came up to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. I would guess that well, this is one of the disciples of John originally who came to follow Jesus. Um, and up above we have the Lord's Prayer, which you should have already read before because we had it in the Sermon on the Mount, which happened quite a long time before. So Jesus obviously told him this. You will find Jesus repeats himself quite a few times. I have been listening back to some of my digging deepers on the, the website just to see how embarrassing I was. And I found I've repeated myself loads of times. And you probably have heard all my illustrations and all my things quite a number of times so far. So don't be surprised when Jesus does it as well. From village to village, as he went around, he probably preached the same sermons. And the disciples learnt them, and when they went off preaching, they probably preached the same sermons as well. So here's Jesus coming up with the Lord's Prayer again. The concept of this, though, um, as I've got down, I think, and here... um, Not repetition, but persistence. So you go to a Hindu or Buddhist place, they say the the same thing, their mantra. They say again and again and again and again. You turn the prayer wheel, every time the prayer wheel turns, it it says a prayer again and again and again. Every time a prayer flag flutters, it says a prayer again and again and again. The idea, Jesus said, yes, you've got to be, say these sometimes prayers again and again, but the reason is not because saying it will make any difference. It's... I want to go to somebody's house. Can you tell me where their house is, please? Oh, yeah, it's down the road. Thank you. And you just stand there. Mm. What do you have to do? You have to walk down the road. And when you get to the house, what do you do? Which is what Jesus says. I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Sometimes God wants to give us things, but he will only give it to us if we're serious about it. If you're not serious enough to go the mile to get there, you're not going to get it. So, once again, this is all about persistence in this particular concept we've got here. So that's the the, the model player at the top, the various different areas that are covered in prayer. And then you have the idea of persistence in prayer underneath it. Um, All these sermons you will have heard a hundred times from other people before me. So, uh, so look, 11.14. And here he's gone on again. And he was casting out a demon, and it was dumb. So dumb demon, what type of miracle is that? <coughs> Messianic. Is it the one that only the Messiah can do? And it came out, and when the demon had gone out and the dumb man spoke, the multitudes marvelled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And others, to test him, were demanding of him for a sign from heaven. That one's from hell. We want one from heaven, please. So, this has happened before. He doesn't actually, in my mind, it said the Pharisees blaspheme here, but he doesn't actually say it was the Pharisees. So it could have been normal people in the crowd. Remember, the, the Pharisees have, as it were, been throwing mud, throwing mud, throwing mud constantly. Some of it's starting to stick now. We start to see reflections coming back from the crowd as well. In verse 17, he knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and its house is divided against itself will fail. We've seen that with civil wars across <coughs> the world at the moment. The country, like Syria, has been torn to shreds yeah. and other people are now moving in and taking over. So the kingdom itself has been destroyed. So Assad is now only a puppet of other groups that are you know, using him for their ends. So any kingdom against itself will be destroyed. Um, so this is Jesus saying, look, if I'm, if I'm Satan, attacking Satan's troops, then this kingdom of Satan is destroyed. End of story. Obviously not. Two illustrations he gives. He says, when a strong man, armed, um, 
this is verse 21, sorry. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisputed. But when someone else stronger than him attacks and overpowers him and takes away all that, all that is his armour and all he relied on and distributes his plunder. So this is talking about Jesus here. I'm coming, I'm stronger than Satan. This is what's happening. I'm taking away his plunder, which in this case is the life of that person. The life of the person who has been um, uh, uh, taken over. But he gives a warning underneath this. And the warning is, the spirit is thrown out of somebody's life. What does it do? It wanders, goes, looks for another home. It can't find another home. It comes back on the off chance that he might better get in and finds, oh, the door's still unlocked. And more to the point, nobody's living in there. Nobody's living in there. And so he brings seven of his mates just to make sure that this time it's not quite so easy to chuck him out. And that's what Jesus is warning about for the people of Israel. I'm coming to... To you now, I'm casting out the demons. I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning the house out. I'm putting it in order. But if you do not allow me to fill it, mm-hmm. others will come back in it and it'll be worse for you than it was to start with. So in that sense, that's what that particular thing is about, mm-hmm. that we're casting the, the, the <coughs> demons out of Israel. Yes, yes that's always troubled me then, because mm-hmm. you know in this deliverance ministry, you think, yeah. well, tell those spirits of fear to go and then... There's no Holy Spirit there. Hmm. The person's worse yeah. off. I ha- I, yeah, I have. Well, I think I have problems where they say <coughs> that a Christian is demon possessed in some ways. Because how can the Holy Spirit be in you and a demon? Mm. I have a problem with that. Mm. Um, I've no doubt there are times when the demons are, as it were, um, enjoying themselves and doing it spectacularly. There's other times, like now, when they're keeping it very quiet mm. and you wouldn't know. And I suspect there are people who are possessed by demons, uh, but they're keeping it very quiet and it's under the radar at the moment. It's all stealth mode. There will come a point in history when it will go back up to full, um, the full pelt. Mm. But I have a problem with the idea that a Christian who has the Holy Spirit in them can be demon-possessed. I might be wrong, I don't know. I've never looked into it properly, but that is a problem to me. So, um, Deliverance ministries aren't necessarily wrong, but I don't think necessarily you can put it down to a demon. I don't think all diseases are down to demon. I don't think all these things, quite a lot of them is, not exactly psychology, but things in the past that need to be forgiven. Mm. And often it's a case that someone needs to forgive other people. To go through their past to forgive people, often for things they've done wrong, often for things that have been done wrong to them, Mm. find forgiveness and then to go from there. And that, Mm. quite frankly, probably takes more effort than chucking out a demon. So. So they're under bondage, aren't they, if they haven't forgiven Yeah, it can be. Um, anyway, uh, get distracted there. Um, Jesus said to them, actually, um, if I, with the finger of God, cast out demons, then know that the kingdom has come upon you. I think, if you can find that verse, I, can't, I didn't write down which... Ah, verse 20. Verse, oh. ver- chapter 11, <coughs> verse 20. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then know the kingdom of God has come upon you finger of God, where does that come from? Oh, no. oh, Old Testament, Ten Commandments. <coughs> and also the rising. <coughs> face. Yep. I found an earlier one. Did you? I found an earlier one. Mm-hmm. Nope. Earlier, nope. Than earlier than that. It wasn't said by um, anyone good, it was said by just a couple of, uh, couple of magicians in Egypt. Um, when they tried to create gnats after Moses had done it, oh. and they couldn't do it, they said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Yes. This is the finger of God. So that's actually where it comes from, because I, I missed that one completely. Yes, yeah, so it goes right the way back to there. So in other words, this, this is <coughs> not exactly magic, but this is power. Mm. So often it says in the Bible, God stretches out his hand. Yes. Yeah. Outstretched arm, yeah. isn't it? Oh, outstretched yeah. arm and an outstretched yeah. open hand. And, yeah. But then just one finger of that hand yeah. is all that's needed to... <laughs> Demon. <laughs> Gone. So... That's where that, that one actually goes back to, I found. Uh, <laughs> sign a journal, we've done that. Um, yeah, this is a nice definition of blessed, I've heard, because it talks about blessed. It's the kingdom of God in your heart. You are blessed when the kingdom of God is in your heart. Mm-hmm. So when, you've been, when you know that forgiveness, you know that peace, no matter what's going on around you, and 
There may not be peace around you, but when that blessedness is in your heart, you know where you're going, you know no matter what happens to you, you yes. know that the debt has been paid. Yes. That, and that's one of the definitions I have of peace and that I like, is an absence of debt. Mm-hmm. So you have no debt. If, if someone's in debt, then that's in their mind all the time yeah. that they've got to pay that debt. Yeah. If it's all been paid off, the mortgage is gone, you don't own any loans. Mm-hmm. No matter how little you've got, you, nobody can take it away from you now. Mm-hmm. That's what I think peace yes. is in the Bible. The debt has been yeah. paid. The price is paid. Um, yeah. So I think, um, I think it was Dr Johnson in his dictionary said, His description of peace was the time of deceit and rearmament between two wars. Mm. That is an earthly form of peace, (laughs) which is what we strive for nowadays. So an absence of war is peace to their mind. But that's not how the Bible sees it. It's going to be a while until we have to stand with all those bills we've got to pay. We've paid off all the houses. Once again, Jesus comes up to the sign of Jonah. So this is verse 29. He says to the Jonah... Uh, verse 29 and the crowd were increasing he began to say this generation is a wicked generation it seeks a sign and yet no sign shall be given it but the sign of Jonah for just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites so shall the son of man be to this generation so this is specifically saying about Jesus later on Lazarus was going to be sort of the, the warm up act but this is specifically Jesus and so to the Jewish people in general, Jesus is the, the sign of Jonah. Eventually, a generation of Jews will accept him, and that will, they will accept the sign of Jonah and repent. But to every generation, and specifically to this generation, which is the, the people who rejected him. Mm. He talks about the Queen of Sheba, who came to see Solomon. He talks about the people of Nineveh, who once again saw those people who saw, who saw um, these prophets, these important people, and as it were, repented, changed their mind. Yes. Sorry, can I just, that verse 30, mm-hmm. whereas Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, I've never really, it hasn't registered before, but they would have known that Jonah had been swallowed by a whale and died and come back to life again. Yeah, well, I mean, whether they would have known that, I don't know, but I would imagine he didn't even, or whether he washed when he got out of the whale, I don't know. Well, but, but the very fact yeah. that they repented. Mm. Yeah. So in somehow, and given Nineveh is Nineveh. hundreds, if not thousands, of miles away from the sea, yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know, obviously, but it, how they knew, I don't know. Whether the rumours spread, I don't know. Was it an actual sign, or just what happened to him? What happened to him, yeah. I think. Oh, okay. yeah. And the fact that he was out at the sea all there preaching, so... I mean, Jonah is one of those strange characters in the Bible. He's the most reluctant prophet going. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he went through one of the most, most, and he's the one that, as it were, Jesus uses as, as an example. See you later. Uh, <coughs> so surely Nineveh would have had a port somewhere. Yeah, Nineveh's got a port. Trading, yeah. They're up the top of the Tigris and Euphrates. Yeah. So whether the, the, the whale dumped him at the bottom of... Um, Actually, it couldn't have been there because he was in the Mediterranean, so he must have dumped him on the shores of the Mediterranean, <coughs> and he went through Syria, yeah. Syria to Nineveh. Because if you go through the top of um, from the top of the Mediterranean through Syria, Nineveh would be at the top there, which is probably modern day. It's just down from Turkey. It's in Iraq, I think, still. Mm-hmm. So just just close to the Turkey border. So you'd have to go through that, I think, unless it's a very fast, well, very fast fish that go all the way round to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that must have something to do with the three days. Yeah. Because that's the same with Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. He rose from the dead on the third day. Yeah. So obviously we'll get to that when we get to the, uh, um, the crucifixion and the resurrection. But. Um, the lamp of the body. Once again, it's another illustration Jesus has used before. No, uh, verse 33 this is. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it away in the cellar. This is God. He has lit the lamp. He has lit Jesus, the light of the world, as you heard in the church today for the sermon. He's not putting it out. Whether you see the light depends on what your eyes are like. So where it talks about the, the lamp of the body is the eyes, this is verse 34. What you can think about is the windows. The windows of the body are the eyes. If they see the light, it goes into the body and you see. If they're dark, if you're blind, you don't see. And that is obviously the, um, the, the image he's putting here at the moment. 
<coughs> the light is lit, are you going to see it or not? Verse 37, probably the most un, um, unpleasant dinner party you'd want to go to. Now when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. Nice Pharisee, isn't it? And he went and reclined at his table. This was on the Sabbath. Um, now one of the reasons the Pharisees didn't jump up and get him at this stage is because they were inviting him. They, he was protected by the laws of hospitality. So that's why they couldn't arrest him or anything like that. But nonetheless, they weren't being exactly nice to him. Um, beforehand, we've <coughs> talked about the, wa- the walls of cleansing. And here's Jesus, who followed the rules of cleansing, because we know in the past, the Pharisees accused his disciples of not doing it right. Here's Jesus going in, in verse 38, and when the Pharisees saw, saw it, or so, um, when the Pharisees saw, he was surprised that he had not first ceremoniously washed his hands before taking the meal. This was something Jesus did on purpose. You're supposed to pour water three times over your hands like that just to prove that you've cleaned your hands. Jesus didn't do it on purpose. He was out for a fight. And they get it. And there, verse 39, And the Lord said, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but the inside is full of robberies and wickedness. Here we go for it. You foolish ones, do not make, need to make the outside, make also the inside. And then we get to verse 42, but woe to you Pharisees for paying tithes. I mean, and verse 43, woe to you Pharisees, woe. This is a fun dinner party, isn't it? <laughs> and then one of this a scribe is a Pharisee who has learnt the law, off by heart. This is their, their law. And he gets to the point, he doesn't mind him taking the mickey out of the Pharisees, the, the, these lesser Pharisees, but now he's taking the mickey out of him. You're, you're, by having a go at these, you're, you're criticising me. You want a bit of the action? Okay, woe to you, scribes. You make laws so that are hard to bear, then you don't even put your little finger on them. Oh, this was a fun dinner party. Um, <clears throat> I think Jesus was spoiling for a fight on this one because he started it. Um, and we go down to verse 30, 30, uh, 53. So when we get to the end of it. And when he left there, the scribes and Pharisees began to be hostile. I wonder why. <laughs> and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. Um, this was a particularly unpleasant dinner party. There's going to have another one later on that I think is slightly different. Um, they weren't trying to be nice to Jesus here. They were trying to catch him out on something. Jesus went. He fought this one. Jesus is very cheeky in these things. Yep, yeah, I think so. Verse, right, on chapter 12. Oh, it's supposed to come to 17. I'm not going to manage this. Um, oh, I'm going to have to jump a whole load of these things. I'm afraid to finish this off. You can look up some of the, uh, of the notes I've got here. Just keep going. Right, ver- chapter 12. Under these circumstances, when so many thousands of the multitude were gathered together, they were stepping on one another. And if you look over the other side, I've, I have a multitude. Oh, the other side, I've got a multitude there. Jesus began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For nothing will be covered up that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. This refers not many to the Pharisees, that they're sort of all nice and proper on the surface, but all horrible inside, but also to the Christian. Nothing that any of us do will be secret, which is alarming. One day, everything will come out. If not on this earth, then before the throne of God. Though fortunately for a Christian, it's forgiven before we get there. But also Jesus is saying this about his teaching. In another place, he says, look, what I'm whispering to you in quiet you've got to shout from the rooftops. But you cannot assume that anything you say behind someone's back will not be shouted out. I mean, I work on the principle, I would never say anything to someone behind someone's back I would not say to their face. Um, Which means sometimes I say nice, nasty things to people. Uh, But better to do that than be nice to people than stick the knives in their back, I think. But this is Jesus warning his disciples. Um... Uh, chapter 12, uh, verse 1. Verse 
one onwards. It goes down, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh, if you read the whole section, is um, so chapter 2, for instance, oh, sorry, verse 2, but there is nothing that will be covered up that not will be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. According to whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner room shall be proclaimed from the housetop. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and afterwards have no more they can do to you. Um, if you think of China at the moment, where the Christians are being persecuted, um, you don't know who is working for the authorities. And you might be in a, a small group of people and what every word you might be saying might be going to the authorities. So that's why, in the sense that you, you don't say anything... Well, as a Christian, you shouldn't say anything anyway about nasty about people like that. Um, however much some of them might deserve it. Verse 13 of chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Jesus was not a judge. He had already said that at the Feast of Tabernacles. I am not here to judge you. And when they tried to force him to judge them, remember the woman caught in adultery. But he said, look, I am not a judge. I will be when I come back as the Messiah, but because I've been rejected, I am not a judge. So Jesus rejects this one, and he comes up with a famous parable. There's a lot of famous parables, by the way, in this particular section from Luke. And here's the rich fool, the man who had a whole bumper harvest come in. What does he do with it? I know, I'll knock down all my barns and build larger ones. Isn't that be wonderful? Mm. He asked advice from the wrong person. He asked himself. Mm. And he gave himself bad advice. And Jesus said to him, you fool, tonight you will die, and then who will get what you've given? The most important verse in that is actually verse 34 of that chapter. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So where do you store your treasure, on heaven or on the earth? And the store, treasure we store in heaven is not gold and possessions and things like that. Um, we have a a similar, um, more difficult parable that Jesus tells in a while. Remember the story of the unrighteous steward? Yeah. The one who um, is accused before his... He may have been falsely accused. Because looking at it, he may have been falsely accused of being an un unjust steward. And the, the boss basically sacks him and says, right, put your accounts in order. What a boss should do is say, right, put your accounts in order, let me have a look, and I will decide. The boss just sacks him and then says to, to get his accounts in order. And he goes, well, if I'm going to be treated like that... And he starts changing some of the bills to get people on his side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it says that the master, or the lord, his lord, said, oh, that was a bright idea, wasn't it? That was a cunning thing to do. And Jesus holds this person up as a, an example to us. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking, what? What's that? But what Jesus is saying is, look, he was using his brain, using the resources he had at his disposal for a short period of time, thinking about the future. That's what you've got to do. You've got to take that aspect of it, take your resources that you have for a short time in this life, and think of the future. What's your future? On this earth or in heaven? What are you doing with your resources to send treasure up to heaven? Are you sending people up to heaven, which is the important thing, so that when you get to heaven, those people that your life ministered to will be waiting for you to welcome you. And that's what Jesus is doing there. So this whole section about money and things like that comes into that. I think I've jumped ahead at least two chapters now. But the idea is where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what do you value the most? This is Jesus talking about him being in readiness for, for when he comes back again. He says, whether I come in the second watch or the third watch and find them so, blessed are those slaves. This is slaves who the master has set to wait for his return. The second watch goes from nine o'clock to midnight. The third watch goes from midnight to three o'clock in the morning. So in other words, this is after, so nine o'clock will be dark, or probably start to six o'clock in Israel, will be dark. Um, those servants are waiting. And it might be at midnight. It might be at any time those. When they come back, blessed are those who the, the master finds waiting. And I was, I'm going away, I'm coming back again. You've got to keep... At the beginning of that section, he says, uh, verse 35, he, uh, he dressed, be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps alight. So I'm going away, I'm coming back again, be ready. 
your servants of God. What you say in secret will be heard out loud. What you work, what you do with the treasures that you have been given, the mammon, the wealth of this world, will be required of you what you do with it. And I will be coming back. So this is once again to his disciples more than anything else. Chapter 12, verse 49. Jesus is getting serious with his disciples now. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish that it were already kindled. Mm. Jesus is love. Isn't everything about love, Jesus lovely? I have come to cast fire upon the earth. That's judgment. But... Verse 50, I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. That baptism was the cross. Do you suppose I come to grant peace on the earth? I tell you no, but rather division. From now on, five members of a household will be divided against three and two against three. Um, They will be divided father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. We don't really teach that for the church, do we? It's all lovey-dovey stuff. Come and everything's nice. But that is to decide or not to decide. It's black or it's white. It's light or it's not light. You believe, you don't believe. That's not peace in the earthly sense. That's division. (coughs) Go down to uh, chapter 13. There had been a disaster in Jerusalem during the feast. This is where my favourite teacher, by the way, puts, puts Jesus' return to Jerusalem. I shall ignore him. At that feast, some Galileans had come along up to the temple, probably started a little bit of a riot, and Pilate had sent in the soldiers and slaughtered them in the temple itself, thus mixing their blood with their sacrifices. So that had been in there. And Jesus said to them, well, do you reckon they were more sinful than anybody else? Because that's the Jewish teaching. If something nasty like that happened to you, it's because you were a sinner. You had done something wrong. And if you turn, uh, if we go to verse um, 4. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed were more or worse culprits than all the rest who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Now, I don't know how the Jews could have this idea, given the book of Job's in the Bible, about that's the righteous person suffering. But their idea was that if you suffered, something like this awful happened to you, it's because you were a sinner and God made it happen to you. There's also something else going on there. There's a prophecy going on here. That last little bit, in verse 5, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all in likewise perish. So how could they all have towers fall on them? How can they all have their blood mixed with their sacrifices in the temple? Forty years later, when the Romans surrounded Jerusalem, all the fighting men were on the towers when they started collapsing because they'd been undermined by both sides. And so most of the fighting men died on the towers. But some of them made a final stand in the temple and the and the, the Romans slaughtered them in the temple itself. So this is looking forward, well, looking forward. This is a warning of what will happen at the destruction of Jerusalem if they do not repent and change their mind about Jesus in these two little verses here. And just below it, you have a, the parable of the fig tree, a, a fig tree that was not producing the fruit. The master wanted to cut it down. And the, the garden says, no, let me have another year. I'll dig it around, I'll manure it. We'll see what happens. If it doesn't produce at the end of that time, we'll get rid of it. This is actually, I think, almost Jesus saying to God, look, the Jewish, this Jewish nation hasn't produced the fruit, but can we have more time? And the more time is the, the preaching of the apostles. So the 40 years from the death of Jesus, death and resurrection of Jesus, to the destruction of Jerusalem was the time when the apostles were preaching. At the end of that time, there was still no repentance, therefore Jerusalem was destroyed. So those ones link together in that sense there. <coughs> After it, though, verse 18, so chapter 13, verse 18, 
This is Jesus. He's been in the synagogue. He's, pre- he's healed somebody and they've got upset about it again. Um, here's two parables we've already had before. Therefore, Je- therefore, he said, he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? And what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and threw into his own garden and it grew up and it became a tree and the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three pecks of meal until it was fully leaven. Do you remember those parables from the past? Mm-hmm. What do the birds represent? Evil. Demons. Demons. Yeah. Evil. What does the leaven represent? Sin. Sin. What Jesus is saying here is Israel is part of the kingdom of God. This is part of the kingdom of God, but the devils have come and nested in it. Mm-hmm. And the sin has come into it and it is taken over. Mm-hmm. So he, he's obviously annoyed with this silly um, synagogue official who's getting complaining that this poor woman's come and been healed on the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. What has what started off as the kingdom of God's being corrupted. Mm-hmm. Same thing is happening with the church. The same, the devil's left in the church and sin is going through the church. The same things here. So Jesus here is applying it to the Jewish, the kingdom of God, a part of the Jewish people. Um, verse 22. And he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. This is what I talk about. He's now gone out on the farther end, I guess, of the loop of his teaching tour. And he's now heading back to Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. Um, verse 23 and someone said to him Lord are there just a few who will be saved and he said to them strive to enter by the narrow door for many I tell you will will seek to enter and will not be able to in Jewish pharisaical teaching if you were a Jew you were (coughs) going to get into the kingdom of God even by the skin of your teeth you were getting to get into it and Jesus is saying absolutely no it is not like that it is based on faith So Jesus is repeating that again and again during this section as he's going round. And look at verse 26. Here's people, at the time of the this particular parable Jesus is talking about, that there's been a feast and they've got there late and they've not been allowed in. And the, the master of the feast said, and they, they would begin to say, we ate and we drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he would say to them, I did not know you from where you are. Depart from me, you workers of evil. In other words, just coming to church and having tea and biscuits in a church doesn't mean you can get into heaven. Mm -hmm. Later on, Jesus actually says, they come up to Jesus and said, but we cast out demons in your name. We healed people in your name. And once again, the pastor says, I didn't know you. So even miracles does not prove that you're a Christian. Jesus repeats this again as he comes into Jerusalem. But he's on his way towards Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children as a hen gathers her brood under its wings and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. I say to you, you shall not see me again until the time comes you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That last bit, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is the words that the people of Israel should use when the Messiah comes. I think I've told you, I've put the, the verse down, you can check up on that one there. So this is Jesus before he's even got to Jerusalem. And they will see him, because they see him at the triumphal entry. But this is when he's coming into Jerusalem, they see him on the cross. So this is something spiritual about something else. He already knows, he's now heading down to Jerusalem, he knows that it's not going to work, but he's still doing it. Ah, another Pharisee. 14, chapter 14. And it came about, he went into the house of the leader of the Pharisees, that's one of the members of the Sanhedrin, on the Sabbath, to eat bread. And they were watching him closely. And it came to in front of, uh, and there in front of him was a certain man suffering from the dropsy. I had to look up what the dropsy is. It's not me dropping things on the floor. It's actually when your body swells up. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a fish. It's so, so it keeps water stuck on the body. So Jesus heals this person. He can imagine. Mm. That'd be quite impressive. And don't yeah. There's something different about this meal to the others. If you read this, it's not combat- combative like the other one was with the woe to the Pharisees. This is the type of 
stuff that Jesus advised that Jesus would give to his disciples. You can see three famous characters on there, mm. if you know the set. Yeah. I look up to him because he's middle class. I look down on him because he's... <coughs> I know my place. I know my place. <laughs> you know. That's what Jesus saw at this meal. He saw them all fighting for who was the most important, and he was giving them advice on this. I wonder if this was actually a fairly decent guy who invited him along, seriously wanting to hear. Mm. There were some amongst, obviously, the guests who didn't, mm. and were looking. But it's so much different from the other dinner party when you read it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's advice that Jesus would give to his disciples. Mm. So I wonder, because it's the leader of the Sanhedrin, I sometimes wonder, was it with the demons? Yeah. But that's complete guest off the top of my head. Um, but he gives them a warning at the end when he comes to the end of the dinner party. Um, verse 16 onwards, you have the parable of the, um, the wedding feast when the man sends out invitations to those who have been long known they've got an invitation to this wedding feast, which is some, and yet they all come up with excuses. I've got to plough a field. I've got to marry a wife. I've got to go and look at this. And he goes and drags the people off the streets and he drags the homeless people in and the rest of it and says, none of those people will come to my party. So that's the final, the final bit on here. Jumping forward... We have the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. I think you've heard those enough times, haven't you? Though with those ones, the chapter 15, the, the thing to notice on those is what is missing in the story of the prodigal son. And the story of the sheep, you have someone who is looking for the sheep. In the, the, the lost coin, you have someone who's looking for the coin. In the lost son, mm. you do not have anybody looking for that son, oh and that was the job of the older brother. And he's not doing it. Yeah. His job would be to look for his brother. Mm. Mm. Or to try to seek him out at least what information he could. So that's what the whole point of that parable is. Oh. There's, there's lots of other l layers. And I'll put some of them on there for you as well that you can look up. Certainly you can say that the good shepherd is Jesus. Mm. The, the, the housewife is the Holy Spirit. The father who's looking out is the God the Father. You've got all sorts of different levels you can put on there. You've got Lady Wisdom who's looking in the book of Proverbs. Who's looking is out on the streets calling out for people to be wise. There's whole lots of different levels on there. But the one specifically Jesus was going is, look, to the Pharisees, you are the elder brothers. You should be trying to help, these, help the tax collectors and the sinners come back to God. You're not doing it. I am. I am the son of God. I am the older brother. I will look for my lost sheep. I will look for the lost coin. I will look for my last brother. Dad. That's the specific um, principle in there. Dad, mm -hmm. with the fact that they were looking for the sheep and the coin, but they didn't look for the son, is that saying, showing a bit about like the Pharisees and about how they care more about like physical yeah. things rather than like the people and all that yeah. stuff? So the, old, the older brother was interested about being a good boy and staying at home and... Mm -hmm. Um, but he wasn't. He didn't. He didn't care about his brother. Mm. I mean, whether he physically would have gone to look for him, or mm. maybe he would have sent out people, but certainly the older brother knew what his younger brother had been doing, because he mm. says, "Your younger brother, my younger brother, mm. has wait, or your son, your son has wasted your money with mm. harlots." In other words, he knew what his brother was doing in a foreign country, so he had information. In a way, he didn't care for his dad either. He no. probably saw that his dad was grieving for the loss of his mm. son. No. And he just thought, oh, I'm going to keep looking after you know, the house. Yeah. I'm not going to do what he actually needs me to do. Mm. Or he's wanting me to do, which is to find my brother. Yeah. So. Yeah. The, father, the father had servants who could look after the sheep. Mm -hmm. he didn't, if that brother had gone and said to his father, I want to go and find my brother and try to bring him back, he would have done it. Mm -hmm. So in that one, that's the... It's the absence of someone searching in that final one that Jesus was bringing out in that particular story. Wise use of mammon, we've already done that story. That's the unrighteous steward. I jumped ahead on that one. Uh, so There's a, a phrase in the Old Testament. Uh, I've put one, put one reference down there to Proverbs, which says, God, um, those whom God loves, he, give, he blesses. And the Pharisees took this idea that if God blesses you and makes you rich, he must love you. Therefore, the richer you are, the more God loves you. Obvious. Um, so their idea was the more money I've got, the, the better, I, better person I am, and everybody can know about it. 
Um, Jesus obviously does not take that point of view. It's a completely different point of view. But that's the unrighteous steward. So you have the story of the unrighteous steward. Uh, so chapter 16, verse 14. <coughs> and the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all of these things, and they were scoffing at him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourself in the sight of men, but God knows your heart, for that is, is what is highly esteemed with men is detestable in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, and the gospel of the kingdom of the God will be preached. But everybody is trying to force their way into it. Um, but it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the law to fail. Everybody who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries another who is, uh, who is divorced from his husband commits adultery. Why is that suddenly a bit about adultery in there? Why is that suddenly turned up? Maybe he just took an example of a law. But there's probably something more about this. In the Old Testament, um, in Jeremiah, I'll very quickly turn it up. I've got down Jeremiah, I think. Oh, Jeremiah 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them out of the... Um, by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. So God counts the Old Testament covenant as a marriage covenant. So in this bit about divorce, he said to the, the, Pharise the Pharisees who love money, you cannot just divorce God and marry money. You are married to God. Don't you understand that? Just to, if you're suddenly going to make wealth your God, you're going to fail. In most of the prophets, it's talking about Israel's being the wife mm. of Jehovah. Yeah, the wife of Jehovah. And, uh, she was unfaithful to her husband. Hmm. She's going off and playing the harlot. Yeah. And he took away everything that he'd given her, which literally everything. And she realised what she'd done and she eventually came back to him because yeah. it's talking a lot about that in all yeah. the prophets and you've got um, on the notes there you've got Gomer as well which is the, the wife of Hosea who was the prostitute yeah. that, um, yeah. these days they also refer to like the church as yeah. married to like Jesus and mm -hmm. quite a lot of things right. I shall rush this last bit the rich man Lazarus why did Jesus choose the name of Lazarus for this particular um, parable I wonder so the poor man Lazarus the rich man inside, who obviously God loved because he was rich. But when they die, the poor man is taken to Abraham's bosom, as they describe it. So you can imagine Abraham putting a shoulder on him. Come on, mate, you've suffered enough. The rich man is thrown down to hell. Or to Hades, up in here. And the rich man says, can't you send Lazarus back as a message to my brothers? And Abraham says, if they won't listen to... Moses and the prophets, will they listen to a man called Lazarus who comes back from the dead? Which obviously might come into the story at a slightly later date. Let's just jump over to Luke 17. Okay. Verse 11. <coughs> Jesus is now on his way back to Jerusalem for the feast of dedication. And it came to pass, he was on the way to Jerusalem, that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. So he's coming down from above. And he entered a certain village... Ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. They raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And he saw them and said to them, Go, show yourself to the priest. And it came about, as they were going, that they were cleansed. Now one of them, when, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back to glorify God with a loud voice. And he fell down on his face at his feet, say, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said to him, Was there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where were they? Was no one found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. While they were lepers, they were equal. As soon as they were healed, nine of them were Jews. One of them was a Samaritan. Actually, the Jews would have to go to Jerusalem to the temple. The Samaritan would have to go to Mount Gerizim. But the Samaritan comes back to Jesus. 
Interesting point here. What did those nine Jewish lepers have to do now? They have to go to the temple. They have to present themselves to the priest. They have to say that I have been healed. What was the healing of a leper? Messianic miracle. So nine people are about to walk into the temple and present themselves and say, I have been healed, to which the high priest would then have to set nine separate sets of investigation to find out whether they've been healed. And if they had, then the person who healed them would be the Messiah. This is where I'm putting Jesus' return to Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. So he sends nine messengers ahead of him to prove he's the Messiah. But when we get to the book of John, which we've read already, so I'll I'll just read this out to you at the last bit. At the Feast of Dedication, um, and at the time of the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple of the portico, and the Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. <laughs> At that time, nine lepers were in the temple being checked over. So that adds that yeah. thing. Thank you for your patience. I've gone over a lot there. Um, that's a whole set. I wanted to get that section done in one piece. That's a big, long tour that Jesus did. Um, Obviously, we've done the Feast of of Dedication, after which we'll carry on from there next time. Um, We're heading towards, obviously, the the Holy Week, which will probably take the rest of the year. (laughs) Shall we finish with a word of prayer? Father, thank you for patience. Thank you for your patience above all else. That you are willing to put up with our foolishness. And you're always willing to give us more chances to dig us around, to prune us, to to tend us. Lord, may we always give fruit back to you. Lord, help us to be, to understand and to know your will for our lives. Amen. Amen.